All right. Welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. We have season two, episode 15. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi. We are missing my co-host, Coach Sam Tooley, and I am down here in Texas with the one and only Nick Bear. Nick, how you doing? I'm good, man. That was a good intro. I like that. That was smooth. That was bold. That was uh, that was one of the best I've heard. I, I appreciate that. I had the whole plane ride down here to practice, and if you like that, you're going to like where I'm going next. So back in Two months ago in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I did a sprint triathlon and I'm standing in line to get my bib and I turn around and I see this Jack dude in a BPN shirt and immediately I knew I knew him, but I didn't know how. And as he got closer, I realized it was your dad, Mike Bear. Yep. And so uh, we got to talking and it was a great conversation. Awesome dude in great shape, as you know, and I don't know how it came up, but I asked him at one point in a wrestling match between you and him, who wins? Before I tell you his answer, I want to get your side of the story. Well, I'm going to say it's probably 100% him. He was a wrestler in high school. When he met my mom, he was coaching wrestling. She was teaching. And that was his sport. Like, growing up on a dairy... First off, he has, he has like, the farmer strength. <laughs> they grew up on a dairy farm. My grandpa was a dairy farmer. My dad and his brother, my uncle Rob, grew up milking cows and working the farm so one they have just central pennsylvania corn-fed muscles just built into them and then throw on top of that he was a wrestler in high school coached wrestling so i'm gonna say my dad said he won so you guys share something in common with your answers you're both very humble the verdict was if if you were standing then you'd probably have a good shot but if he got you to the ground that uh that he would come out winning so i think you guys are both fair there it's probably a close fight either way i would probably i would i would try to muscle it and probably try to choke him out that would be my go-to <laughs> see like if you watch me and my brother fight or wrestle it is the most pathetic excuse of a fight ever there's no strategy there's no skill we try to get each other's necks and take each other to the ground and just choke each other out I always wanted to be a wrestler in high school. I did. And uh, for some reason, I never dove into it. My dad was you know, a big influence in my life. And he would always talk about it. You know, in, in central Pennsylvania, wrestling was, was popular. And I remember this one story. Because wrestling is a unique sport where you're trying to constantly make a certain weight class, right? And you might weigh, say, 160 pounds before a, a competition, for a match, we have to get to like 145. I remember being in high school and some of my friends were wrestlers and they'd have to drop weight like overnight. And my grandma says my dad was insane about it where he put on his sweatsuit, he would go work out all night, he would starve himself, not drink any water, he'd make weight, and then he would just binge afterwards and put it all back on. So I think of wrestling, one, I think of my dad, two, I think of The Rock, <laughs> Dwayne The Rock Johnson, and then three, I think of cutting weight mm -hmm. severely, like losing weight, gaining weight in order to make this weight class. It's a unique sport, it really is. And it's it's so much skill and strategy. Yeah, it's a really tough sport. I wrestled a little bit in middle school, ended up going more with the football route. I like the team aspect of football. But, you know, I, I think we jumped right ahead. For a lot of my listeners, I think they know who you are. Um, but for the people who don't know who you are, what's the elevator pitch? I mean, there's a lot to cover. Yeah, so... I am the founder and CEO of Bear Performance Nutrition, prior U.S. Army Infantry Officer, and over the last 10 years, nearly a decade now, um, I've spent my life pursuing this dream of building this brand with amazing people, with amazing products, serving an amazing mission, and we're just getting started. I love that. And you mentioned the word pursuing in your uh, in your answer, which is funny because this is the pursuit podcast. But if you had to look ahead and usually we save this question for the end, but we'll just come right out with it. If you had to look ahead for the rest of your life and you had to pick one thing that you're pursuing as a person, it, it could include business, it could include relationships or whatever feels right. What is that thing that Nick Bear is pursuing? I think it's just constant growth, right? Like I want to finish 2021, looking back at 2020, saying that was a crazy year. We did a lot. And then 2022, I want to look back at 2021 and laugh saying, I thought that was a crazy year. Let me tell you about this year. So I want to keep pushing forward, right? I just want to keep taking 
one more step forward, one more step forward in, in growing. And I think a lot of people think that means making more money. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't. It means building a team, reading more books, becoming smarter, building systems, building businesses. I love the startup community. Mm-hmm. I always want to stay in the startup community of building businesses and working with people who actually committed and care about what they're doing. I mean, that's one of the best places to be. When you're working with people who care what they're actually doing, I think you almost lose touch with reality because that doesn't exist Mm. everywhere or even many places. So for me, looking into the future and what I'm pursuing, it's just constantly leveling up myself in terms of being a husband, a future father, a business owner, a leader, a friend, and just, you know, I'm a student. I'm a student of life, and, and that's what this pursuit is. Now, if I had to look at my future in, let's say, you know, when I'm 70 years old, 60, 70 years old, I want to own a farm. I want to have property. Mm -hmm. I want to have bison and longhorns and chickens and goats. And I want to create all my own food supply, produce, vegetables, fruits, meat, everything. And uh, just go back to like this simplified way of living Mm. you know i i love working my hands i always have when i was younger while everyone else was kind of getting really involved in video games and sports i fell in love with woodworking Mm. like my grandfather had this wood shop and he would make things so i did the same thing he helped me build out this workshop in my garage when i was 12 years old instead of asking for a video game for christmas i asked for a a power saw and a drill so i'd build things uh like tree houses and a wine rack for my mom. And I I remember this one time when I was younger, we built this, this boat. And essentially it was, I used, because we grew up in this neighborhood that was being built out at the time. And I know I'm going really, I'm going all over the place with this, but I'm bringing it back, I promise. We lived in this neighborhood that was being built out when we were younger. And we were like one of the first houses in this neighborhood. So there was constantly construction and there were dumpsters, so I would take my wagon around, I'd dumpster dive, I'd pull out all the wood, I'd take it back to the house, and I'd build you know, a little fort, a tree house, and I'd build a boat this one time that we put on top of a, a raft, multiple rafts, and we took it to the, like, the local river. And my parents supported it. They are like, all right, we'll throw this in the back of the trailer, and we'll let it sink, and that's what it did. But ever since I was young, I loved just using my hands and building things And that's kind of what has happened with BPN, Mm -hmm. you know, and I always see myself pursuing to build something, whether that's a business, a property, a family, a friendship, I am in the building business. Yeah, I think that's so cool. And it's interesting to hear you go back to your childhood and talk about building things. And obviously there's a difference between building a boat out of wood and building a business that's impacting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Where for you along the line did building turn from just doing it to create to doing it to create and impact other people? I mean, when you originally created Bear Performance Nutrition, was the goal to impact people uh, in the way that you're doing now, inspiring, encouraging, educating, motivating, uh, or was that something that just developed along the way for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think when I first started, I created BPN because I loved creating. I loved building things. I didn't really know much more than that. You know, you you don't know what you don't know. So when someone's younger, I think, I mean, I'm, I think it's powerful when someone's young and they say, I want to impact lives. I want to change lives. And why that's so powerful is because for many people, they don't even know what that looks like or feels like. They might have had some sort of experience with it. And if you've had some sort of experience with that, you've probably gone through something when you were younger. But when I first started and created BPN, it was because I loved creating. I started the business in 2012. I didn't start using social media until 2014. I did it it backwards. Most people start their social media platform. They build this following and they try to monetize it. Mm. I said, I want to build a business. And I said, all right, the business isn't growing. How do I grow it? I'm going to create a social media platform to help build it. And even when I started the social media platform, it was to share and document the progress 
that I was making, share some tips in, in fitness of, of weight training and nutrition and eating right and sharing recipes. And then this community started to build and, and grow out of it. And then you start hearing feedback like, love your recipes, they're great. Love your workout tips, they're great. And that evolves to, you changed my life. I've, I've made these positive impacts. And that's where you start. It, it, it's this evolution, right? There's not one day you wake up and say, I'm now gonna create to change lives. Mm. But I think it's one of those things where you start, you start doing what you love. And if you do what you love and you're passionate about it and you, you're doing it right with integrity and values, people are gonna naturally attract to it. And where most people mess up is people attract to it and they say, I gotta monetize it, I gotta monetize it. For us here at BPN, we created this community, this tribe, and we just kept staying the path. Mm. We just keep staying the path. And, and I was doing that podcast with Christian Huff the other day, and he used a really good analogy of the fruit flies and the, the horse. And the horse just stays on the path. And all these things, these fruit flies are going to try to distract the horse. These fruit flies could be people. It could just be things that happen in your life. They're going to try to take you off course. But if you stay the course and people like what you're doing and they see, they're going to stay with you. Right? So I think the evolution of impact and influence has changed over time. And now that's why we create. Mm -hmm. Now that's why we do these things. That's like we're launching this, you know, doc this weekend, more than the miles that led to 100 doc, and it's powerful. And this documentary truly empowers everything that I've really wanted to say over the last, like, really two to three years. And when I sat down with Jordan, our creative director, he was he was asking the question, like, what what is your intent with Leadville 100? And we could have done it the same way we we used to do a lot of videos where it's I'm going to go around 100 miles let's document it and then show people what can be done and it just didn't feel right it just didn't it didn't fit it it wasn't the message that I wanted to portray hmm. I wanted to portray the BPN team as this guide to create almost this call to action at the end where it's this is what a group of people that are following a mission and want to accomplish something in life when they come together they can do anything. And it wasn't me crossing the finish line. It was we crossing the finish line. It was the team. And, I mean, this doc is powerful. More than the miles, is, it just it, it brings it all together. But the journey has evolved to, to that. You know, you, you, me, everyone around us, the BPN ambassadors, the athletes, we all have influence, and we all have an obligation to use that influence in the right way doesn't matter if you're you know a school teacher mm. captain of a football team you're you're in the government you you own a business your influence is powerful and it has secondary and or second and third order effects you need to consider that because it can change lives it can also ruin lives oh man there's so much there and i'm gonna rewind the clock here with what I'm about to say, but I will weave it back in. I was a freshman in college at Bucknell University out in Pennsylvania. I had walked on to the football team. So this was 2012. I walked onto the football team and I gave up drinking at the same time. So in one scenario, I gained a group of friends. I, I gained teammates. And in the other side of my life, I lost a lot of friends. And then football was taken away from me because I made a tackle and lost a chunk of my eyesight. And so now all of a sudden I lost everybody that I had and those connections were, you know, they were there, but they weren't as strong. So I was in a tough place in the beginning of college and it lined up with when you started putting out YouTube videos. And I have no idea how I stumbled across one of your videos, but it was you like warming up a bowl of oatmeal in a microwave. That sounds about right. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. But right. And, and what was it? 2017? Uh, in 2000, 
Ooh. No, this was like 2014, maybe. Okay. When were you? When did you get on YouTube first? 2014. Okay, so like right around there. So 2014. Yeah, 2014 and 2018, I lived on oats, man. <laughs> oats and protein powder. But there's something about the way you made them, or you made the videos rather, that just drew me in. You were authentic, and you know, I think you'd probably admit it wasn't the best quality, but it was. You were starting, and you were doing something, and so I was drawn to that, and I started following along, and. As you started to grow, I started to feel better about myself because I was starting to do some of the things you were doing. I was taking action. I was moving forward. I was trying to create. And it was all from watching you from afar. And I think the beautiful thing about social media is that we wouldn't be sitting here right now. I would not know you. We'd not be recording this podcast. People would not be listening to it if it wasn't for social media. And so to your point, it's really powerful and, and lives can be changed in such a positive way. I think what I want to ask you is obviously there's the other side of social media. There are the people who aren't supportive. Um, there are things that maybe aren't productive. And I know personally, I struggle with those things. And you know, you, I would imagine face some of the same. So from the perspective of somebody who's just looking at your social media from the outside, they see this big following, awesome content, inspirational message, great team, good mission. What does the other side for you look like? Yeah, I think I would be lying if I, if I said there wasn't another side, but there definitely is. And the BPN team, you know, certain members, uh, my brother, Jordan, Trey, they've seen me like kind of go peaks and dallies, highs and lows with it, where the, in the intent is always there to help people. The there's pure intention. I can, I can confidently say that everyone in this building that works here has the best intentions to only do good and to help people. And the world is a dark place. There, there is, I was thinking about this in my run the other day. The world is a dark place. It's, it's filled with evil. It's filled with bad people trying to do bad things. And they don't want to see others succeed. And when the world gets dark, and it's going to get dark every single day, and if, if you let it, it's going to stay dark, you have to be the light. You have to be the light that shines away through that darkness. And that's the guide. Like That light is the guide that says, when all this darkness is around us, I'm going to shine this light. When you shine that light, all eyes go on you, right? In a dark room, and someone turns a flashlight on, everyone's looking at that person with a flashlight. Or your movie theater, and someone's phone goes off. Same thing. And some people are going to say, I'm going to follow that light because I want to get out of the darkness. And some people are going to stay in the darkness. And they're going to say, turn that light off. It's, it's bugging me. It's bothering me. And that's what social media can be sometimes, right? There could be a million people saying, good job. Like, Thanks for doing this. I appreciate the content. You're motivating me. Love your products. And there can be one person that says the right thing, which is actually the wrong thing. And that's all you can think about. And you, you lose sight of the good you're doing. You're, you're bogged down. You're weighed down by this one person. And what I had to learn is you can't please everyone and you shouldn't try to please everyone. If you try to please everyone, you're not going to please anyone throughout the process. If you don't stand for something, you better be ready to fall for absolutely everything. And when I reinforce that idea in my head where it's, I need to stay on this path. I know where I'm headed. I know what I'm doing. I know who I want to be and I know who I am. I want to be this, this light. I want to be the light in the darkness. And it's just like the fruit flies on the horse. People, things, events are going to try to knock you down. And it's, it's easier said than done to say, just ignore it. You can't always ignore it. Mm -hmm. You got to realize where your path is taking you. And if you don't stand for something, like I said, you better be ready to fall for absolutely everything. So to wrap it all up, yeah, man, social media can be hard. It can, and uh, I think about when, when me and my wife have kids in the future, they're not going to have like, the childhood that I had, where I remember growing up in my backyard, catching fireflies, playing 
capture the flag, mm. playing sports. I remember I had a Nokia phone. My dad gave me a Nokia phone when I started playing sports. He's like, call me when you're done with this. It's like, I'm not using this. This is a pain in the ass. Threw it in the drawer, never touched it. And then look at us now where we can't go five minutes without picking it up. I don't want my kids to be doing that. I want my kids to be out there running, running the dirt, catching fireflies, playing capture the flag. And that's where, where that's where I go when I think about social media. It's powerful, and it can do really, really good things. But it also can do really, really bad things. You have to, you have to take responsibility and realize that social media is what you make it. The content that you consume, the things that you watch, the things that you listen to, the people you follow, that's who you're going to become. If you're listening to trash and you're watching trash and you're listening to arguments and watching videos of people making fun of other people and that kind of stuff, that is who you are, whether you like it or not. But when you watch and consume and listen to, you know, biz, I listen to business books, business podcasts. I'm trying to constantly be a student of life and learning in terms of, of business, family, fitness, nutrition, the supplement industry. And when you are consuming only good things with good people, that's who you're going to be. Hmm. So it's, it's really easy to point a finger and say, social media is ruining this, this world. Social media is the devil. It's the evil. Well, what does your social media look like? Who are you following? What are you watching? What are you listening to? Because I bet you I'm not listening and watching and following the same people. That person might be. So that's where that's where my thoughts are on on social media. Yeah, it's a it's a great point you make there at the end. And I think when I think about social media and when I think about criticism and, and all those other things, are you familiar with the man in the arena quote by uh, Theodore Roosevelt? I am not. I, I've heard man in the arena, but I don't know if I know the specific quote. So I wish I was in my office right now. I have it behind me in my office, but we're in Texas. So I'll paraphrase. But Theodore Roosevelt in 1910 gave this uh, this speech and in the speech, he talks about being the man in the arena, the person whose face is marred with blood and dust and sweat. And at the end, he wraps up this whole paragraph by saying, and the people who are in the arena will be set apart from the cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Essentially saying, it's the person in the arena doing things, that's the person that matters. Whether they're winning or losing, at least they're better than the people sitting in the cheap seats that don't know what it's like to even do anything. It's true. Yeah. It's true, man. It's I would rather be out there doing something and failing. I would rather fall on my face and people laughing at me and pointing fingers and saying, you can't do this. I knew you wouldn't do it. Yeah, at least I tried. At least I put myself out there. You know, when I first started my business, the amount of people that made fun of me, that mocked me, that made like – meme type fake BPN hmm. graphics and content and said, you'll, you'll never, you'll never make it. There were dozens and dozens and dozens. And you know how many I talk to still none of them, you know, it, it's one of those things that when you try to do something that is out of the norm or seems outrageous or unbelievable, which is Matthew McConaughey's least favorite word, unbelievable. You're going to challenge people's internal standards for themselves. And when you do that, you're going to ruffle some feathers. And in life, like I truly believe you have to ruffle feathers. You have to shake things up. And if you don't stand for something, they're just going to walk all over you. Yeah. Like believe in something, truly believe in it, truly want it, and then fight for it. Like fight till you, fight till it kills you. I would fight for BPN till it kills me. Like I would die for this company. People probably are listening and saying, you're crazy, man. But no, I would. I would literally die for this this company. I remember telling Steph, she got so mad at me. I was about to leave for Leadville 100. I was about to take off at the, the starting line. And I went into Leadville 100. Like, I was ready for it. I was hungry. Whole team was out there. I I, I knew I had to finish the race, not just for myself, but I mean, there were a lot of people that, that were counting on that. Like, there might have been someone in their home and 
some other state somewhere, some other country, thinking if he does this, like that, that'll that'll motivate me to do something else. And when I left to take off for that race, I told Seth, I was like, I'm going to finish this race whether I die out there. She said, no, you're not. Don't do that. Don't say that. I was like, I will die. I will literally die before I don't finish this race. But if you don't have that passion for something, man, it's, it's, you're missing out. You know, do you ever, do you ever have so much passion for something and then you come across someone that's doing the same thing you're doing? but they don't have that passion and you almost feel bad for them. It's, it's almost embarrassing. Like I'll talk to some other supplement company owners or people in the supplement space. And I'm so passionate about this business and the space. And I talk to them and I realize they don't have that same passion. I'm, I'm, I feel bad. I'm like, man, I feel bad that you don't feel this way about your business, about your industry. Yeah. Why are you doing it for a paycheck? Man, you're in the wrong business. Yeah, I, I think that passion, at least for me, started to really build when I realized life was bigger than just me and that, like we've spoken about, that our actions have a ripple effect and they impact more people than probably we'll ever know. Um, and one of the things that really clicked for me was when I realized that my wife was the person I wanted to marry. Um, we both got married during a pandemic. And I just listened to the podcast that you did with Christian Huff. But if you were to kind of speak to your relationship with Steph and marriage and maybe some of the big lessons that you've learned uh, through the beginning of your marriage so far, I can imagine that there are quite a few um, because I know personally I am up at 4 a.m. I'm going all day. I'm, I'm busy. I'm working. I'm passionate just like yourself. And I realized that I am so selfish when it comes to certain things. And I didn't realize that until there was another person whose life I was uh, intimately sharing. Uh, has that been the case for you? Yeah, I think most people, they always lean on communication, communication, communication. And yeah, that communication is definitely important. But before I got married and I heard everyone tell me that, I'm like, what the shit are you talking about? Just, just talk to her. Is that all I got to <laughs> do? I can do that. I'll talk to her. I think the the biggest things I realized after being married for a year, almost a year now, a year in uh, like three days actually, wow. is uh, setting expectations and intention. Like going into something intentional. If we're going to dinner, it's not just we're just going to grab food. Like we're going on a date. It's It's intentional. Phones are left in the car. We're having a conversation at dinner. We're sharing a charcuterie board, a, a bottle of wine. Like we go into that with intention and expectation set. Clear example where I messed up, which I actually like the first seven months of my marriage. I talked about this on the podcast with Christian is going back to being selfish. I wanted to keep building and I still do, but I was at this moment where I had this opportunity to do another Ironman prep to build BPN's exposure and at the same time accomplish a personal goal. So I jumped into this Ironman prep without even asking her or telling her, knowing that it was going to be 20 plus hours of training a week. I was going to be gone. I was going to be tired. I mean, during an Ironman prep, you're smoked at the end of the day. You have no life or energy to give to anyone else. And running a business and documenting that series took a lot out of me. And I didn't set expectations going into it. I mean, I remember, I don't know if I told this on the podcast with Christian, but I remember we were on our honeymoon after we got married, we went to Cabo, this beautiful resort. And, you know, I was working with Natasha, my Ironman coach at the time. And she said, Hey, you're, you're going on your honeymoon. Like, do you want to just take some time off from training? I said, no, give me the workouts. I'll make it happen. I think it was like the second day we got to Cabo. I had a 14 mile run on the schedule and I didn't want to leave the resort because there, it was like highways and stuff. So I ran 14 miles on the treadmill while Steph was down at the pool second day of our honeymoon. And I felt guilty, but at the same time, I also wanted to be selfish about it. And I wanted, I, I when I'm doing something, I'm all in. Like when I say I'm doing X, Y, Z, I'm doing X, Y, Z. I'm all in. I'm not pulling back. Like the reins are not being pulled no matter what. 
at least how, that's how it used to be. And I didn't ex- I didn't set expectations going into this Iron Man prep or marriage. And I think we both, me and her, we didn't communicate this. So we had two completely different expectations of what that first year of marriage looked like. And I had to learn that the hard way is when you set expectations and intention and that's how you communicate. That does a lot. <laughs> I, I wasn't in Iron Man prep, but I learned a very similar lesson through a very similar experience on my honeymoon in Maui, Hawaii. So um, I can relate. And I, I think what I'm wondering, because for the people listening to this podcast, I'd say some are married, some are in relationships and some are single. Um, would you say that those same principles carry over in a similar way to any relationship that you're building, whether it's in business, um, a friendship, a romantic relationship that's not a marriage? Um, do those things carry over for you to business and other things? 100%. I mean, we are, we are in the business. Everyone's in the business of, of people. You're in the people business, whether you, you think it or not or whether you like it or not. So that's when I, when I see people that are in business – and they say, I don't like people. I hate people. Well, you're probably a pretty shitty business owner then. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. It's all about building relationships and taking care of people. This past year has been a, a huge learning experience in terms of, of building relationships. More importantly, like business to business relationships. As BPN has grown, we've had to work with, with other businesses to accomplish goals. Mm-hmm hire software companies, hire companies to build things out for us. You know, we have this vision. We don't have it in house, find someone to outsource it to, to bring it to life. And I realized that we go into things, giving people the benefit of the doubt. We trust people. We want to take care of people. We want to partner with people. And sometimes the other side isn't mutual and they just care about that check they're getting and nothing else. And I only want to work with people who want to build relationships. Like when we go into business to business calls now, we kind of set the tone early on. We want to build a relationship with you. We want to be able to lean on you and you lean on us. If we can't do that, nothing against you, but let's just not work together. It just doesn't, doesn't mesh. Right? So we're all in the, the business of people and building relationships. And if you can't build a relationship and maintain a relationship and you want to keep burning those relationships and those bridges, you're not going to get really far because like I always say, you can go really fast when you're alone, but you can go a whole lot farther when you're together. Yeah, I agree. I have, I have two thoughts that are in different directions, but you know, some of my following are in the healthcare profession, physical therapists mainly. And one of the things that I learned early on uh, out of school was that relationships were the first and foremost important thing that needed to happen before you could help anybody. And so instead of going into a new patient encounter and saying, tell me about your shoulder, or why does your knee hurt or what happened? Uh, my first question was always, tell me something about yourself that's not related at all to physical therapy. And we'd start that relationship and it worked really well because I realized that the stronger Uh, relationship or rapport or trust, whatever you want to call it, between a clinician and a patient or even just a person and a person, the better the outcomes. And I think that goes for healthcare, it goes for business, it goes for any relationship. The other question I have for you, and it's more rhetorical, but have you heard the story of the $6,000 egg? I don't think so, but that sounds like an epic egg. That's one of those eggs, just like you crack it open and it's the orangest of orange ever. Let me hear about it. Yeah. So I'm going to have to get you this book. So um, it's a customer service book. I'm really fascinated by all things customer service and just relationships. So um, this this the author, I think his name is Todd Duncan. He's talking about how his wife and and him go out every week to the same restaurant for dinner. So they've been regulars there for probably a couple years and they go out to dinner and the restaurant's running this special and it's a it's a special burger with an egg on top. So he orders a waffle and he asks if they can put an egg on top of his waffle. And they say, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We have to save all our eggs for the burger. And he says, well, it's just, it's, I'm a customer. I just want an egg. You know, my wife and I frequent this place and, you know, you can just run across the street and buy, you know, another dozen eggs. And they said, I'm sorry, we can't do it. And so he got up and him and his wife left and he tallied up what they usually spend annually at that restaurant. And it was $6,000. 
and he refused to ever go back to that restaurant. And that's making a longer story short, but the point was that the customer service was what completely turned him off, and it was just the simple fact that they wouldn't go above and beyond to serve him. Um, and I just thought it was a really powerful story and something that you guys here at BPN do an incredible job with um, is just supporting and serving and building relationships and community with the customers. Um, and so I don't know if you have any thoughts on all of that, but I do want to be respectful of your time. So I'll let you go for a little bit with whatever you got. And then I have a final question for you. I mean, I could go for <laughs> for days on on service and customer service. I guess to get started, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also one of those people that when I'm working on something, I'll talk about it. I don't always hide it till it's done. So I finished, I'm in a big, uh, Seth Godin kick right now. He's the best. All of, all of his books are just powerful. And when I was reading purple cow, when, when he says that the opposite of great is being remarkable. That stuck with me. I was like, oh, that is gold. That is gold. I don't want people to say we are great. I don't want people to say that our, our products and service are great. I want them to say it is remarkable. And I'm going to tell every single one of my friends. So I had this this concept. And hopefully it doesn't, someone doesn't steal it before I bring it to life. And uh, I mean, actually, I hope I hope people bring it to life. I hope they do. I really do. It's something I want to start in the new year after uh, after January, and it's called the Remarkable Service Plan. Traditionally, customer service is a defensive position. You're responding to lost shipments in, in terms of our business. Lost shipments, returns, maybe the wrong flavor was shipped out, which is pretty rare, uh, or just questions about the products. Unless you're in like sales, where you have a sales department that is in outreach, there isn't really like an offensive service plan. And typically if you have a sales department that's doing outreach, you're selling something that's pretty valuable. It's more expensive. So I have this strategy and this thing I'm building out right now, it's called the remarkable service plan. It's essentially offensive customer service for BPN, where we build out a separate customer service department that calls all new customers one week after delivery to check in. Hey Joe, saw you ordered some some flight and some whey protein uh, a week ago. Saw it was delivered uh, a few days ago. Just wanted to check in, see if you have any questions, if I can help you with uh, any any directions, how to use it, how to mix it up. Or if I can answer any more questions you have in, in regards to supplementation, training, or, or nutrition in your diet, I want to help you reach your goals and get stronger. Did you just call me after I spent $50 on supplements? Yes, we did. That is our remarkable service plan. And that's like my idea with it is I want to really build out customer product experience. One of the things we're testing right now is, you know, if you, if you, order from BPN, you get your supplements shipped to you. It's in a brown box with the BPN logo on one side and the BPN icon on the other wrapped around. And I'm thinking, how do we make that a, a better experience? Like when you get your package, what if it was customly or custom printed on the inside and outside, there's inserts in the inside on how to use your supplements about the bare standard, about our, our story. Um, and really build out this this experience with it. Obviously, you incur a cost with that, but does that cost you incur help you retain a customer for longer? And then when you open that package up, you know you're you're already impressed with the packaging. You're impressed with the drop ins that are educating you on the supplements, on the company, on the brand. Then you try the products, and you're like, these are amazing. This isn't just great. This is remarkable. And then someone calls you a week after. That's like, that's being in the business of people. That is taking care of people. That is serving people. So that's something I want to launch in 2022. That's how, that's how firmly I believe about good service and taking care of people. I mean, I think it goes a lot deeper as well. 
like the root of service to serve to serve people um that's why i love being a business owner with a team that's why i love being a ceo with departments and team is because i get to serve departments and team members and employees i like taking care of people i, I always have i've always enjoyed it i want to pay people as much as possible i want to promote within i want to create all these benefits like that is what that's that's the purpose for me like that is what i love so yeah service is is pretty important to me yeah i i think that's so cool and i can't wait to get my first package in 2022 i probably have two two to my apartment a month something like that the ups guy probably thinks i'm i'm nuts or something but i can't wait for that you should see my supplement <laughs> stack at home it's i have like 10 bottles of whey protein. <laughs> um, so to be respectful of your time, I have one question we ask every guest, but one question I want to ask you in particular, this is an easy one, softball. What is your favorite BPN product? Man, actually, that's a tough question for me. Um, I'd say currently, it probably always has been, greens and reds together. Strong greens, strong reds. My day just like isn't the same if I don't take my strong greens and strong reds in the morning. But I'm actually really excited for a new product we're releasing, which is our sleep supplement mm -hmm. called Peak Sleep. We worked on this formula for over two years, and then there was a new ingredient that was released, and we were like, got to use that. All right, now we're ready to launch. Um, it can be made cold or hot. We have an apple cinnamon and a chocolate flavor launching naturally sweetened naturally flavored non habit forming no melatonin it is uh two grams of pico 2 which is a mushroom blend by compound solutions 5 htp magnesium and levagen plus sleep is deeper better quality you wake up more rested it's amazing we're actually putting that one through a clinical study wow yeah, so I'm really excited about that product. Okay, I'm gonna have to get my wife on that. She's a big melatonin girl. She, uh, she's she's got a problem, but we'll switch her over. Um, and just to go to the reds and greens, I don't know if it was you who said this or where I got this, but you can't be number one if you don't go number two. Is that you? I, I say that, but I took that from my friend Matt Vincent. Okay. He said, you can never be number one if you don't take care of your number two. That's what it is, there yep. you go. Matt, I hope you're listening to this podcast. Uh, I'd love to connect. But um, but so to wrap it up, Nick, and this is a little bit of a deeper question. Take it how you will. If you could leave the world with just one message, right? And you could only say one thing for the rest of your life, but it gets out to everybody. What would that message be um, to the world? Well, there's a reason I've tattooed it onto my body. It's go one more. <laughs> I think I think go one more to say for me. It, it's gained more meaning over time for me. Like when I first said it, it was powerful and I, like, I, I truly believed it. But when I saw how much it impacted people and when hundreds, if not thousands of people get that tattooed on their body as well, you got to think that means something to them too. It's not just going one more in the gym. It's not doing one more rep. It's not working one more hour. It's, it's going one more, doing one more thing every day, whether that's, reading another book to increase your education and business doing one more run to lose weight you know going on on one more date night with your wife to improve your your relationship when you go one more on a regular basis it compounds when you're consistent with it it compounds consistency compounds and i think if if people just apply that to their life i mean it can even be seen as my wife brings up sometimes, you know, when one of her goals when she goes out and walks around is I'm going to find someone, I'm going to compliment them, some random person. And it makes her feel better. Like when she, she sees someone on the street and they're just going about their day, you stop them and say, you know what, I really like that dress you're wearing. It looks really good. And then you can just like a smile kind of light up in their, their face. They're surprised by it, kind of creeped out probably. <laughs> but it makes her feel better, it makes Steph feel better that she is making people happy. And you can apply, go one more to that. You know, it's, it's, it's pushing the needle forward in every part of your life 
to improve not only your life, but the lives of the people around you. So powerful. And again, I just really appreciate this time because I know you're extremely busy. Um, but I want to give you a chance, you know, if people don't know where to find the supplements, if they haven't heard of you until this conversation, where's the best place for the listeners to find you and to find the supplements? Yeah, so the supplements are sold under Bear Performance Nutrition. That's B-A-R-E. And uh, on Instagram, I am Nick Bear Fitness. I host a podcast called The Bear Performance Podcast. And on YouTube, I think we have like over 750 videos uploaded at this point that have documented my life from 2014 when I was a brand new lieutenant in the, the Army as a platoon leader in the infantry up until now. And we're, we're launching our Leadville 100 dock this weekend, which is going to be epic. But uh, we have a collection of content that showcases the wins, losses, successes, and failures in my life over the last seven years. Awesome. So if you guys want to learn more about Nick, follow his content, head over to Instagram, to bearperformancenutrition.com, to his YouTube channel, and uh, you will no doubt be inspired. So thank you again, Nick. Thanks, Joe. That's a cut. <laughs>